the Center of Excellence in Nanomedicine at UCSD, we create new matter, uh, new materials to interact with energy, um, specifically light, in ways, new ways that no one thought would be possible. Essentially, we're making new materials, new matter, with improbable properties that don't exist in nature, or not found in nature. I'm here to tell you a little bit about these materials, but a lot more about what motivates us. So I'm holding in my hand, in my hands, the um, discoveries of many Nobel laureates, many geniuses that dedicated their lives to come up to generate the knowledge required to build this laser pointer that I'm holding in my hand. We often use things without thinking about them and how they're um, thinking about them and how they came about. So this should work. <laughs> so laser technology really started when a young Albert Einstein was sitting in a windowless room in 1917 writing up equations on stimulated emission. Nobody knew that this would have any importance of any kind. He was curious and imaginative. And it took decades after that that Alfred Kessler, who also won the Nobel Prize because he theorized that you can reach that state of stimulated emission by optical pumping. Again, theory. Well, soon after that, a team from the US of scientists and from Russia were able to lay out the fundamental theories on how one might build a laser. OK. Um, for that, they also won the Nobel Prize. And soon after that, there was this global race on who would build the first laser. And it was a young man from Malibu that did it first. Now, could you imagine that any of these scientists were motivated or even thinking that people wanted to use these lasers to cure their wrinkles, to whiten their teeth, to um, remove unwanted hair? It's mind-boggling how lasers have become so fundamental to many industries, including healthcare. In bloodless surgery, they're used. In ophthalmology, they're foundation fundamental in ophthalmology. In dermatology, it's hard to imagine, actually, that laser technology for decades was referred to as a solution awaiting a problem. But that's really what I want to impress on you today that when scientists are curious, when engineers and scientists are curious uh, about fundam uncovering fundamental concepts and understanding how nature works, that they can uncover tools that can be applied in revolutionary ways that create new revolutionary technologies. So one of the biggest impacts of laser technology was actually in fiber optic communications. That's what enabled the information age that we enjoy today. So some applications on the horizon of laser technology, it's been 50 years since the first laser, or a little bit over that. But there are even more exciting applications right on the horizon, and that is in uses uh, for pest control. So to, lasers are so cheap now that you can create a laser net around crops to zap away pests. Well, another application is in eradicating malaria. You can create, instead of having a net to prevent mosquitoes from biting you, you can create a laser net uh, to eradicate these or to kill off these mosquitoes that could cause malaria. This is exciting. The defense now has new laser weapons um, that shoot down or burn flying, threatening objects. And here's the exciting part. It's at a fraction of the cost of missile technologies. Um, and when I mean fraction, it's between a thousand times to a million times cheaper. That's exciting because it'll have economic impact, huge economic impact. We know the defense's budget. Um, but to be honest with you, what myself and many others in science and engineering think the greatest impact of laser technology has been in laser spectroscopy and microscopy. It has allowed us to uncover fundamental constants of nature. OK? Um, it has allowed us to see how a cell splits, how viruses enter into cells. It's allowed chemists, I'm a chemist, really. Um, it's allowed chemists to understand how atoms come together, bond to, to form molecules. Um, and so it's really revolutionized neuroscience, 
biology, medicine, medicine. So the most impactful application of laser technology has really been as a tool for researchers in chemistry, in biology, in physics, in medicine to better understand nature. So in front of you is um, an electromagnetic spectrum. This is basically energy that we get from the sun. Okay, these are many types of energies that we get from the sun. And almost every one of these types of energies has been used to better understand since those days, to better understand nature and thus to treat disease. Um, now, what if I told you that there remains a form of energy that is underutilized and its potential is not yet fully tapped to better understand nature and to treat disease? So this type of light is sandwiched between the visible regime right here That's the light that your eyes can see. That's why it's called visible light. And infrared light over here. And that's the, the energy or the light that's used in your TV as a remote, as in your TV remote control. And um, some, so light in this area here is called in, uh, near infrared light. And it enjoys properties from both sides, from the visible and from the near infrared, uh, and from the infrared. So like visible light, it can do chemistry. It has the right energy, visible light has the right energy to undergo chemical transformations. Now, that is what gives us, that's what photosynthesis requires. That's how we all get our food and our fuel. It is crucial, okay? You can do chemistry with this. Uh, now, in, uh, infrared light has that wonderful property that can travel through living systems, it can go through buildings, it can go through our skin. Um, and so we thought, or we dare to imagine, so let me, let me actually give you a demo of this, because I think it's seeing sometimes is believing. So this is a uh, red laser here, okay? And this is a green laser here. If I put the green laser on my thumb, you won't see the light. It doesn't pass. It, it scatters, because it's in the visible regime. This red laser is not yet infrared. It's near infrared. It's closer to near infrared light. If it was really near infrared light, you couldn't see it. But just to demonstrate, see how it goes through my thumb? You see that? Thank you for dimming it. That's, that's the difference. It can travel through living systems. And at some times, it can do chemistry. Much less chemistry than visible light, but it can still do chemistry. And it can still travel, maybe less than infrared light, but it can still travel through bulk turbine media. So we dare to imagine, what if we could use this property, these properties together, to have a remote control that can do chemistry in living systems. Okay, what if we can make materials that could do that? So we, the, what you see in front of you are these nanocarriers that we can build in the lab. They're between five nanometers and a thousand nanometers in size. What we can also do is package them with all kinds of um, biologically interesting molecules because they do chemistry, like proteins, drugs, um, peptides, diagnostics. We can package them inside these nanocarriers. And when we do that, we essentially are able to turn off their chemical activity because we isolate them. And we thought, what if we can break apart this nanocarrier, this nanocapsule, so that on remote control command, we can release these proteins and these diagnostics and these therapeutics. And now it's like telling them, okay, go ahead and begin to do your chemistry. So we have now remote control over the activity of these things. And that light that we're using is the light that can go through your body or, the, or other living organisms. So um, I, I should take a step back and tell you, or help you relate to the nanoscale. So um, the distance from my heart to my fingertips, if I was a little taller, would be about a meter, okay? My thumbnail is about a centimeter. That's 100 times uh, smaller. And my blood vessels are about a millimeter in size, which is 10 times smaller than my thumbnail. And it can fit thousands of blood cells in there. Blood cells are about 8 microns in size. And those are about 1,000 times smaller than a nanometer. So our nanoparticles are 100 nanometers. These are our nanocarriers. And so the idea that we dare to imagine is that can we fit, form these nanocarriers, load them up, we know we can do that, load them up with these uh, molecules of interest and administer them into 
uh, living system, such as our bodies, and they would circulate and travel into tissue, be able to get into tissue. And um, when uh, we shine this kind of light in a specific location, selectively, we um, dismantle or break apart this nanocarrier and release this uh, molecule, these molecules of interest. And that's when they can begin to do their chemistry, because they're able to do uh, chemistry. But, OK, what's the challenge in all this? One thing I didn't tell you is that you need a certain kind of energy in order to do uh, chemistry, right? And this kind of light doesn't have a lot of energy. And that's a good thing, because it doesn't, we don't want it to, do, to have too much energy could harm our tissue, OK? Just enough. So the problem is it's very low energy, and we need to give it some oomph. And we thought we could do that with this process called chemical amplification. What chemical amplification is, if one event of absorbing this packet of remote control light could trigger a change in the plastic, the designer plastics that we make. By the way, these nanocarriers are made out of plastics that we make in the lab. Um, if that can happen, if it can break apart just a part of it, it can unmask a chemical unity um, that could then cause a chain reaction, like a domino effect. One comes off, the whole thing falls apart eventually. So this is um, what that would look like. So here's our nanocarrier. Uh, we uh, shine light on it. These are the polymers that make up, or the plastic that make that up. When one a uh, chemical event happens, it causes a domino effect that breaks apart the polymer strand. And hopefully, that would poke enough of a hole in the nanocarrier that would then allow this pr the protein, the diagnostic, the therapeutic, whatever biological molecule of interest that's in there would get out. So um, we did manage to do that. And what I'll show you next is uh, an actual picture of these particles. Um, before and after irradiation with light. So this is before, up, and this is after. And we did poke a hole in there. We got everything that we wanted out. No one thought this would be possible because soft matter doesn't respond to this kind of energy. And then we could do chemistry with, with whatever's in that nanoparticle, with whatever's in that uh, nanocarrier. Um, so this was highlighted in certain um, science media as an important advance that no one thought would be probable and that it could be useful in medicine one day because this light is like remote control. It can travel into our into living systems. We didn't really think about a particular problem that we wanted to solve with this. To, I'll be honest with you. We just thought, okay, matter doesn't do this. We're going to make it do it. Um, just for fun, actually, to be honest. But um, then we started thinking, okay, how do we apply this? <laughs> or what important problems can we uh, address with this? And one of the things that we started working with is in uh, ocular drug delivery. So um, we're using it now to treat uh, age-related macular degeneration. Uh, with with um, a dose of light, you can release your, your medicine. Um, I think probably, in, and it could be used in prostate cancer and breast cancer. So we believe this is a very important platform, powerful platform technology. Um, we actually think even more importantly, this would be useful for researchers that are trying to understand how a particular protein works. If they can uh, selectively, in time and in space, um, deliver the, the protein where they want it, say if they're studying zebrafish model, they can study the function of that protein. Um, and that, that could be um, of a similar impact uh, as other cell bi uh, uh, laser microscopy and laser spectroscopy to selectively administer proteins, drugs, diagnostics to a specific location in tissue and animal models. So we think of it as a research tool for um, uh, biologists and for doctors. So what I really want to impress on you today, again, is that if you are curious, if you want to uncover new fundamental concepts, um, and if you want to create new matter that has new properties, all you should do then, follow those, that curiosity uh, and enjoy the, the joy that comes from understanding and uncovering things and that you could put it out there for humanity because it's filled with these bright minds that will use it as a tool to solve problems. And that's when you can have like quantum leaps in technologies and really revolutionary stuff. It's not from going out, you could do, you can approach 
You can approach a problem, a specific problem, and go back and find the solution. But oftentimes, if you really take a good look at history and science, it's, it's when you create a solution before you see the problem um, that it really does give us revolutionary technologies. That's really what I, what I want to leave you with. And then, the last thing I want to tell you is a side project that we work on. So I want to ask the audience, um, please put your hand up if you've ever struggled to lose weight. Great. So glad you guys are honest. So I've had that experience about two years ago. Um, I had a baby, and um, I had some weight to lose. And I guess my... Uh, I was invited to give a, a, a talk in Mexico City. And uh, my baby was five months old at that time. And I hadn't taken any vacation or anything, any break, um, and busy working. And then I guess my mind was really anxious at that time because I knew I was going to take a, a beach vacation in the Mayan Riviera. And I had all this baby weight to lose. And so I, I landed at night. I woke up the next morning with this. <laughs> idea on how to melt fat. Um, <laughs> I, I knew that gold nanoparticles and gold materials of the nanoscale regime were amazingly efficient at absorbing near infrared light travels through tissue and then turning that into heat in a very controlled manner. And I knew that scientists were using this to eradicate, to ablate cancer. That's a very noble um, use, but I thought I could probably use it to melt fat. Uh, no one ever thought about that. I looked through the literature. So as soon as I, um, that, that same day, uh, the next morning, honestly, I spent that, those four days of my vacation by the poolside with my laptop, feverishly exchanging emails with my brother. He happens to be a world-class reconstructive and plastic surgeon at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and he said, this, this will revolutionize laser-assisted assisted liposuction. Uh, because it gives unprecedented spatiotemporal control of uh, fat melting. Now, this is my brother, by the way. And so as soon as I managed to get back into the lab, we started doing our first experiments, which is to inject, uh, to take this, these, this material, it's clear, and to mix it with the tumescent solution that plastic surgeons use when they're doing liposuction, and to inject it into this layer of fat you see here. Um, and within less than two minutes, and this is an actual picture of the data, some of the, the early data, uh, we melted the fat in a very controlled manner. Uh, so we really think that we're going to change the way people do liposuction. It's going to be fast, that's very important, very controlled without any burning. Um, and uh, all it takes is you ta the surgeon would take this solution, this new photothermal injectable liquid heating, inject it into the fat layer, expose it to our uh, near-infrared uh, light source, and uh, it would melt the fat, and you could remove it uh, with a cannula, and removing everything that you injected in there. And the side effect of this liquid heating is that it uniformly contracts the skin that overlays without any puckering. It just uh, tightens everything up. So <laughs> that's... Uh, that's it. Thank you very much.